All right, General Chemistry Podcast 6.1. We are going to start looking at the gases now that we've looked at uh, uh, in general, solids and liquids, and we've looked at some quantitative measures. Now we're going to go back to look at the properties of matter, like gases, and we're going to be quantifying these different things. So we're going to be doing some more math, some more calculations. But before we can do that, we need to take a look at some of these general properties of gases. The first thing we need to know is that gas molecules are relatively small. Relatively small. Okay, so gas particles are very, very, very tiny compared to liquids and solids. So your next blank on there, liquids and solids are relatively large. So comparatively to one another, gases are very, very tiny. They're single atoms sometimes, or even two atoms stuck together sometimes, like oxygen and hydrogen. Whereas liquids and solids tend to be very large molecules, and they take up a lot more space, so they act a lot more differently. And uh, this third bullet point here says that gas behavior is unique. Um, in the sense that it, it kind of does its own thing and there's some kind of funny properties about it that we can look at to use to describe them. Uh, before we can do that though, we need to talk about the kinetic molecular theory and this describes the properties of gases and there's four different points to the kinetic molecular theory that you need to understand. The first point is that gas particles are so small the volume of an individual particle is negligible. And negligible it's kind of an SAT word, and this means that it's so tiny it's not going to matter. So we're just going to call it zero. Okay, so the particle or the volume of a single gas particle compared to the volume of their containers is so, so tiny it's negligible. It's zero. Okay. Uh, the second part of this is that particles are in constant motion. So they're always moving in constant motion. They are always going from one place to another. They're flying all around you right now. They're flying through the room. They're flying uh, out of my mouth as I'm talking. They're just always scattering everywhere, every single direction, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Collisions with the walls of the container are the cause of pressure. And we're going to come back to pressure on the next slide. But essentially what it means is that as tiny gas particles run into something else, that little tiny force that they exert is, is uh, multiplied billions and billions of times as atoms run into the wall of this, and that's what we see as pressure. So like I said, we're going to come back to pressure. We're going to be looking a lot at pressure as we go through this unit. Uh, let's see, number three, particles exert no force on one another. And this kind of ties back, oops, F-O-R-C-E, this kind of ties back to, to the first part, the first tenant of this theory. And it says, well, if gas particles are so small, their volume is zero, well, then they should never run into each other. They're so tiny that as they're moving from one place to another, gases never interact with one another, okay? Their particles exert no force on one another. And number four says the average kinetic energy of a gas is directly proportional to temperature. Proportional. So the average kinetic energy of a gas, or the relative amount of motion energy that there is, is directly proportional to temperature. So the higher the temperature we have, the higher the energy in the gas, which makes a lot of sense. As you get worked up and you start moving really fast, your energy is increasing and you get hot, right? Gases work the same way. So if we increase the temperature on a gas, their pressure, or I'm sorry, not their pressure, their temperature is going to rise as they start moving faster. So four parts of the kinetic molecular theory, one, two, three, four. You need to make sure you have these understood because I'm going to keep referring back to these throughout the unit. So I want to talk about units of pressure for a few minutes. We know that the pressure is used to measure various properties of a gas. Gases are so small that I can't really collect them too easily, but I can look at the pressure that they exert, or I can look at the force they exert on other things, and I can make measurements based on that. And there are multiple units of pressure that we're going to look at. So let me change my pen color to black real quick. The first one is the Pascal, and this is one of the the bigger units of pressure, we say that the Pascal, the definition, one atmosphere, or one atmosphere of pressure, and I'll get to that in just a second, is equal to 101,325 Pascals. Or this can be equal to 101.3 kPa, kilopascals. Okay, so this is the standard unit, right, on the... Um, the measure of pressure from from the seven international units. So this one is the standard and everything else is derived from this. Okay, The atmosphere is the second one and we're gonna come back to this in just a second. The third one, MMHG, this is millimeters of mercury 
And this is what you see on like barometers on the news and things like that. This can also be called tor and this can also be called bars or millibars. Okay, they all mean the same thing. But what this is, one atmosphere, we're going to relate back to that, is equal to 760 of millimeters of mercury, tor, or bar. It's all the same thing. And so the atmosphere kind of falls in between where this is 760 millimeters of mercury, or it's the 101.3 kPa. We're going to use all three of these as we go through the unit. The atmosphere is the one that we're going to be looking at the most, but millimeters of mercury is still pretty pretty frequent among the measurements that we're going to be taking. Pascal's not so much. We're going to, we can convert back and forth to it, but we're not going to be doing it as much as we would with millimeters of mercury and atmospheres. So let's take a, a quick look at here. I want you to draw this on the bottom of your page as I change my pen uh, color back to white so we can see it a little bit easier. But what we have here essentially is we're going to draw a picture relating pressure versus altitude. On the bottom here I want you to put sea level. So this is where the ocean meets the ground. Sea level. This is the lowest solid ground we have. So this is all water out here. And then way up here up by the title. Okay, this is outer space. So this is as high as we can get in still inside the atmosphere and this would be a very tall mountain and you would be up here climbing your mountain looking very happy waving hello. We can relate pressure to the relative altitude uh, that we're at and what this looks like is as your altitude increases okay so altitude increases so we have a very high altitude up here and a very low altitude down here your pressure changes inversely. So we have a very low pressure up top and a very high pressure at the bottom. So this line represents pressure. So this is an inverse relationship. Inverse relation. Okay. As one increases, the other is going to decrease. And this makes sense. Remember, uh, think uh, if you've ever flown, right? They talk about airplanes being pressurized, and if something happens, the mask falls out, and you have to put it on your face so you can breathe. That's all due to pressure. Uh, the air pressure up high in the sky, 33,000, 34,000 feet, you know, 10,000 meters or so, this is a very, very low pressure. You're not going to be able to breathe too, too well. Uh, so what they do is they get higher, the airplane gets pressurized, and there's um, a higher pressure inside the plane than there is outside the plane, and they can measure that difference and make judgments based on it. Uh, think about climbing Mount Everest. You see people wearing face masks to help them breathe this because the air pressure is so low there, it's very difficult to breathe. Uh, this is just a relationship that I want you to realize because we're going to be talking about balloons popping as they go up and everything having to do with pressure. So as we increase our altitude, our pressure decreases. So a high altitude equals low pressure and vice versa. Uh, if we're in terms of atmospheres, if you're at sea level, the atmospheric pressure is, is by definition one atmosphere because I have one entire atmosphere above me. If I go up halfway, this would be half an atmosphere. Then if we're up at, at the very, very top in outer space, this is zero pressure or zero ATM. So we can put this on a relative scale as well, and we can convert again between units. So what I want to do before we finish up is I want to look at some pressure conversions. And these are done the same way as chemical conversions. So all we're using is ratios. So if I want to know how many pressure or how many atmospheres of pressure is 755 tor, well, if I set this up in a ratio, okay, so 755 tor, in a ratio, if I want to cancel this out, I put tor on the bottom, right, and then atmosphere is on top, just like we would a chemical conversion. Any, any conversion is done using a ratio. We know that one atmosphere is equal to 760 tor from your chart uh, two slides ago. So 755 divided by 760 gives me a pressure of 0 0.993 atmospheres. So 755 is relatively close to 760, pretty easy calculation to do. Well, what if we want to go from 110.7 kilopascals to tor? Well, this, this one's going to be a little bit more complicated because remember, kPa and tor weren't directly rated. We had to go through that atmospheric step first. So if we set up a conversion, 110.7 kPa, we can convert this to atmospheres, right? One atmosphere is equal to 101.3 kPa. And that'll cancel out that unit. And then we need to do one more conversion into tor. So now I need to flip my ratio. I need to flip this guy over and say that 760 tor 
is equal to one atmosphere and that cancels these out and I get a final pressure of 830.3 torr. So these conversions are really simple. That It's just learning a new conversion factor. I want you to do C and D on your own. Also, you have some critical thinking questions now, and these are new, and these are ones to get you going. And this is what I'm going to be looking at to make sure you've really watched the video, because you're not going to be able to answer them if you haven't watched this. So it's kind of a catch-22, if you know what I mean. Um, the other thing you can do is read section uh, C1 and 6 in your textbook from chapter 5. This is all chapter 5 now, and there's some textbook questions, and then there's um, some worksheets attached at the end of the packet that'll help you with some pressure conversion. So uh, we're just getting started. Uh, we're going to be using this a lot more, so please get the practice in, and I'll see you in class.